parts of your time. Media asked me the same thing just the other day. We, want, we can't cover you because, you know, you're two years ahead of your time. And the worst thing um, voters hate is when there's an election very near and you start knocking on their doors, asking for favours. Will you vote for me? Well, I'm starting two years hence. Gun and knife crime has been the pet subject of Boris Johnson, Ken Livingstone, and now Mr Khan can't, because he can't, we all know he can't. Mark Prince, fellow boxer, fellow professional, and a very good friend of mine, has suffered enormously. Mark is one of those parents who were unlucky enough to come up against such a catastrophe, a fatality in his life. It wasn't called for. It's something none of us could ever dream about. Your nearest and dearest, your, your son, your daughter, or a close relative. You know, hence the saying, it could come to a street near you. We hear it all the time and we think, well, it's not us, it's all right. But here today we have in the room an extremely brave parent who I'm sure lives with the thought every day of what if, what if I'd this, what if I'd that. It wouldn't have been any different because whatever's cut out for you in life, is my opinion, is what you're due to face. But, you know, in many cases, things happen to us and it's not in vain. Mark has picked up the baton, so to speak, and he hasn't walked with it. He's run with it. He's walking through the pain, the tears, the agony, the what-ifs. And it's situations like this that have really got to me. Got to me personally, because it's the people at the lower end of the scale that aren't being heard. If you're a celebrity, you're up there uh, in a, a famous soap, as, as is the case, and you've got all the big boss behind you, of course you're going to be heard. But the people, the fraternity who really hurt, the fraternity who are reaching out, and saying, hear me, hear me, hear me, are not being heard. So this is what this gathering is all about today. The coming together of people, everyday people. The coming together of what I call the working class poor. I'm not talking about degradation. I'm not talking about hunger. I'm talking about the hunger for justice and recognition. So without further ado, may I introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to Mark Prince. <laughs> Do Dr. Mark Prince! Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. 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 Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone that's come in today. Um, I want to just thank Winston for inviting me here, giving me this opportunity. I also want to say what big kahunas he's got <laughs> for, um, for stepping up and running for mayor. Because um, as brave as I am, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't see myself doing it. Um, but but we've all got different, we've all got different um, destinies in life that we have to follow. And um, I just want to let you know that I'll support you in any way that I can, Winston. Because we've come to a time in, in the time of this world and society where I think it's high time people wake up, start taking back charge and ownership um, of their life and realising that it, it seems like the separation between them and us is becoming more and more apparent. Um, and it's almost like we don't have a voice. And as my man Winston said, it's a class thing. It's not black and white. Um, the government pushed that agenda. 
I think the system pushes that agenda to have the people fighting amongst each other. But the minute that we actually wake up and realise that we are the people with the voice and the power, they need our votes. Um, and if they're not doing what we are expecting them to do, then they shouldn't be in the post. You know, people that's in the post and made promises, we should hold them accountable to what they're saying. Um, so, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey, because I leave Winston to do all the political talk. I'll talk to you about the journey that I've been on. <clears throat> now, I didn't lose my son. Um, my son was murdered. He went to school, like, like um, your, some of your kids or whoever's got children here go to school. And I'm sure there's people that have had kids, and they're big now. Um, but my boy was going to school. Um, and I love my children, dearly, like any other parent out there. And I wanted to give my, my son a great life, a great start in life, um, like we all do. I recognise when I was young that I had a pretty rough um, childhood growing up. I had to run away. I was homeless at 15. Um, and... You know, that was pretty rough, and then I got into a wrong kind of company. Um, and it, it took me to sit down one day and realise that I don't want this life because it's not good for my children. Um, I'm not going to be an example for my, ch my children. So what I wanted to do was change all of that. So I made a decision at the ripe old age of 21 um, to... to to take a grip of my life and do something and become someone. So I had this crazy idea to be a, a boxer. Uh, I've been abusing my body with drink and drugs since I ran away from home at, at 15. So for the last six years, my body wasn't in no shape. And a lot of people laughed at me when I said I was gonna box, but I decided to, to do it anyway. I believed in myself and fast forward um, eight, nine years, I was number one in the country. I was number one in the, the world by the WBO governing body. I was in the top 10 in the other governing bodies, the WBC. So I was seeing everything that I envisioned come true by hard work and belief. And this had an effect on my children and my whole vision of being an example to them worked. So my first son, Kyan, took this on board. I obviously was just everything to him, um, you know, it was his idol, his role model, everything was dad, dad, and uh, he wanted to be like me. Um, so he was a footballer, he had talent in football. And even though I trained him and everything else, he was a talented footballer. So to see him excel in football and to see Queen's Park Rangers call me in and say, your son's only 15, but he's so good. We're gonna, we've got plans to put him in with the grown men and get him into the first team um, because he's, he's too good for the guys his age and we think he's going to be a star in the future. Um, only to get a phone call and two weeks later hearing that my son's been stabbed and I've had to drive from my home to Whitechapel Hospital to see my son lying down um, motionless and a doctor telling me that he's opened my son's chest, massaged his heart and he couldn't bring my son back to life. Um, so that spiraled a crazy journey of immense pain, which led me into, into hospital, all sorts of grief and hurt materializing itself physically and emotionally. Um, only to have this vision that and this understanding that Maybe my son didn't die in vain. Maybe there's something that, that I have to do. There's a part that I have to play in it. And it wasn't revenge and killing to get back the person that killed my son. And I realised the community was watching me as well. So everything was on top of me. What was Mark Prince going to do at this moment? And I felt there was a powerful time to set the president to do something good and um, to show people how... There's another way of doing things, and to show the young people. Um, so what I'd done was I began this quest 
of going out and reaching out to the same people with the same poor mindset that took my son's life. Because we talk about poverty, but really the real poverty that we struggle with is the poverty of the mind. Um, people have a very poor mindset and that's what leads to knife crime. Um, and we need to spend more time enriching young people's minds um, instead of spending so much time throwing things at them, um, brands at them, um, everything that doesn't fulfill them and give them substance. And this is what I wanted to do because I gave my son, I built the right character. It's almost like I was trying to give him the blueprint for life. So whatever he wanted to do, he could become successful at doing it. Uh, and that was building the right character because I recognize along my journey of, of coming off the streets and trying to channel my focus into work, I learned and built certain characteristics, determination, of sacrifice, hard work ethic. And I just felt that I had enough tools to pass on to these young people. Um, before this, I was working for um, Islam Council and um, I'd, I'd gained a lot of knowledge by working in the system and seeing how things worked and realized that a lot of how they work was tick box and it wasn't really about caring and getting results for the young people. So I thought, why not I start a charity and I'll focus on really caring about the young people and getting results, uh, giving them the support that they need. But I found after my son was killed and there's all this media attention and they're calling you in and I'm doing interviews after interviews and I'm into going to the House of Parliament and I'm meeting the mayor to everybody and they're giving me awards, Children's Champions Award and I'm going to get an award from the Prime Minister and all this stuff because I'm going out helping the children. But what I really needed was resources and not a pat on the back because I have a vision and a passion to work. Um, I've, done all the, I've done all the signing autographs, being on TV, I've done all that. This is a different quest that I'm on. And I just wanted to be heard and to be listened to and I soon found out it was a bit more like a circus. You know, oh, this is the latest crime and oh, it's a, it's a, it's a boxer's son. The guys, are, this, this, this is really great news. This is something we can, you know, and it was, it just seemed like, wow. And I was in my grief thinking people really care. And I soon began to realize that no one really seems to care. No one's, there's a lot of talk, but no one's doing anything. And I, and I, and I go to all these stuff with the government and, and I think, yeah, they're gonna, you know, they really want to support me. They really want to help. And I go to the mayors and all sorts of stuff. And then nothing was materializing. And I was, over a while, I started getting it. I started to understand how this circus rolled. They bring you down, they talk to you, they take information from you, they come out with this uh, new legislation, they come out with some new thing that they're going to talk about and do. But it was all talk, no action. And what I saw after my son was knife crime just spiralling out of control and until it seemed like people were getting used to hearing this news and they wasn't feeling like how they felt with um, <clears throat> um, Stephen Lawrence and Damalola Taylor and Kyan Prince. It wasn't that same impact. You know, it would hurt people, but it was becoming so regular that it began to, to just become just another kid that's been stabbed and killed and years were passing and I'm still plugging away. But the problem is, I, I, you have a family to take care of. You've got, you've got, you've got your own aspirations to want to live a life. And so, so I've been struggling and battling with my commitment to, to make this, build this charity to impact more young people and at the same time trying to survive and pay bills. Um, and and you, you, you'd go to Mopac, you'd get a funding bin, you'd go to Scotland Yard, you'd get a, go for a funding bid, only to get a turn down. But before you'd, you'd go in the meeting, you'd hear how awesome you are, you'd hear how brilliant this is, and you'd even hear how the Home Office needs to get this spread out all over the nation. This, 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 this solution that you've come up with needs to go nationwide. 
and then you'd hear, okay, let's start it in my borough. Okay, cool. Let's start it in your borough then. Okay, nothing. You know, the reality of the journey is th this is this is this is a cold place to be. It's a cold place to be when when you realise that. Oh, this is this is worse than being in a fight. This is worse than any fight that I've been in. This is the toughest fight that I've been in because many times I've been tempted to just, you know what, forget this. Let me just go and get a job, take care of my kids and my wife and not go through all this struggle. But I can't. You, you stand up in front of, like I was last week, 600 young people, students at school. The place is silent. You could drop a pin. You're breaking it down to these kids. You're seeing young people, students, emotional, crying. They've, they've got a wake-up call. They've realised something. And then you know these same young people, I can do a programme and continue working with them, supporting them, helping them. You know, we've got so much things that the young people are dealing with. I'm always getting these um, things on my phone where there's this young person missing, for instance. I'm sure some of you have heard about this. And it's like drug dealers from in the country, they, 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 they get vulnerable kids and they get them to sell drugs. They, you know, catch them with things. There's an iPhone, here's some money. They say, yeah, just come and we'll do this for the day. And the next minute they're up, they're in country and the parents don't know where they are. And they're, they're frantic, sending out messages. And I'm looking at it and I'm just thinking, poor parents. They don't know what's going on. You, your kid's all right but they're not all right. They're, someone's got them, but they'll, they'll get them back in about a week. But for that week, you're in total stress, breaking that you can't sleep, and your kid's being held selling drugs. Some against their will. Some are going for it. Why? Because they've been sold the lie that they need to have an iPhone, they need to have the latest trainers, they need to have these things, so they'll take the risk and do it. So things have changed. Education's changed, but but the school system's the same. The, the, the young people need our services. And I'm speaking not just for me, you see me here, but I'm speaking for all the other organisations and all the other parents that have suffered and stepped up and said, let's do this to help. Let's open this. Let's reach out to more young people. And what I say is, what kind of government do we have that can look at parents suffering that getting up, doing the work for them, and they're not going to support them. You know, because that's one thing that you're grieving and you're going out to do all this work, but you're actually trying to deal with the problems that from the hierarchy, from the very top, that's what we put them into government to do. So we as a community and the people at the top work together as a team because we're all together, we all live together. And, and we're all supposed to be working and taking responsibility for our part. So parents take responsibility for their part. Uh, the government take responsibility for theirs. The music industry take responsibility for it. The media take responsibility for it. Everyone, people that deal with the internet, everyone's supposed to take responsibility to make sure that young people are safe. And this is not what's happening. It's all about money. That comes first. It's not caring about young people. There's problems in our police system. There's problems with our politicians. There's cover-ups going on. We just look at Grenfell. You know, police commit a crime and it's, you know, no one's been held accountable for, for hurting people, citizens that they're supposed to be uh, taking care of. Um, it's, it's, it's a mess. And, and we're in need of someone who cares about the people. So what's wrong with giving um, my man Winston McKenzie an opportunity? Because we've given all these other guys an opportunity. And, and what have they done? We've seen it time and time again. But, but we, we want to we wanna look at them and think, oh, yeah, you fit the bill. You know, you, you talk really smart and all that. But your heart, it's about your heart. We, we want to look at people's heart and, and do you stand up for righteousness? Do you stand up for justice? Do you stand for the people? Do you stand for what really matters? And we're not seeing that. And, and I think if the people stood up and said, no, we're not, not going to have this. 
because you, you want to put in bicycles. When Boris was around, he wanted to put in bicycles. Like, seriously, the people never called for that. We didn't call for that. We've got councils, I drive around the roads, we've got councils making these bicycle lanes. But where are the bicycles? Where are the people riding the bike? You spent millions on these lanes. You've, you've messed up everyday people driving in mad traffic every day. You can't even get to work on time to build these bicycle lanes that are not needed. Well, like I, for me, I don't get it. I see what's going on and who's speaking up for us? Who's speaking up for the people and what we want in boroughs, in London? You know what, press, press play. I want to show you something. So hold it a sec, yeah? I want to give you an understanding that the government, London, they know who I am. They know what I do, okay? They've seen my work. They've seen it work. And they've left me, not just me, other organisations as well, to continue you know, lonely burrow, furrowing away, trying to make an impact, you know, so patting you on the back, knowing that you can make a massive impact if they gave you a premises, if they tried to give you the resources. And, and, and if they want to monitor it, then monitor it. Because we know that some people are just want to siphon money out of people, the greedy ones. But you can't look at everyone like that. If you want to have a system that monitors where your money is going, do that. Because for me, I'm all about results. I want to see young people's lives change. And if you see that there's people like that within London, then you need to back those people. Okay? So here's some of the work that I've been doing. And here's some people, prominent people, who understand what I'm doing and are saying that we need to have this on a bigger scale.
back that guy and would you back it if he came with a vision, infrastructure, business solution and strategy? Okay. So how come I'm still in the same situation I was when I started the journey after my son was killed? If anyone can answer that question for me, that would be nice because I'm baffled. The government is paying for Every time, Mark. Every time. Yep. And, and the people don't matter anymore. No. Nope. It's numbers. They don't matter. You are spang on. I mean, I've been coming to London for 45 years, and never more than today is it prominent when you go to Demonos. Yes. You drive off the slip road and you go, well, this, this is Demonos, and you see it constantly. But you see it in Hollywood. We go to America a lot. Yeah. And, and, and basically what happens is you have a vision the politicians pat you on the back to make them look good. That's it. You've got to bypass the politicians. Yeah. You've got to go to the people. Mm. You remember, for years and years, yeah. it, I don't know if they still do the talks at Hyde Park Corner. Do they do that, where you got up on a soapbox? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I used it? to see that as a kid. Kay. That's what you've got to do. Carry Kay. a soapbox. Forget. Politicians are career people for four yeah. years and yeah. five years. Yeah. And then they get a pension. Then they yeah. get a load of money. So forget them. Bypass them. That's what you're doing wrong. Cool. Bypass them completely. Cool. But well done. It was a great presentation. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I took up my man's idea and I thought, let me bypass these guys. Okay. No hard feelings. I'm not going to be bitter. Um, I'm not bitter with the guy that killed my son, so I'm not going to be bitter with people that shut doors in my face. So let me focus on what I can do. So when I was 45, I decided to train myself for a year, get myself back in shape, because I looked at the current crop of fighters, and I said, okay, just like what Winston said, if you're a name, then everything's easy, yeah? So I said, well, let me make myself a name again. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna win the British title, and then I'm gonna get myself right back up there and watch how easy it's gonna be for me to get back in, people supporting KPF, yeah? I've got the spotlight, I've got the, I've got everything. Do, 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 doors getting shut again in boxing. Now, when I, when I came out of boxing, I had an injury to my knee. So I came out based on a, a doctor telling me I couldn't fight again. But I believe that. Now, when you fill a man with a belief and passion and it's 13 years since he last was in the ring, you know what you're going to come up against. You're too old, shouldn't be fighting, blah, blah, blah. But I know that I'm a different breed of guy. And with my belief and my hard work ethic, I'll turn that around. And that's what I've done. So what I've done, when the door shut in my face, I said, let me go a different route. Bruce, my man, beautiful. Okay? So I went a different way, just like Hay and, and um, Derek Chisora, when the British board, they had that big fight and the British board stopped them from, they still got another license and fought in London. So I'd done the same thing, fought at a York Hall under the Maltese license. Um, what I wanted to do was let the board see that you're making a big mistake, I've passed all my medicals, I've got tested, I went to a special uh, clinic, sports clinic in Brighton, 
that test top athletes. I went there, got tested, and they written a cover letter saying the awesome condition I'm in. They've got no reason to not relicense me. So I've done all that, and the board is still shutting the door in my face. I think there was some politics going on because maybe I fought on the license that they didn't want me to fight on. So because I weren't playing ball with them and playing that humble, that humble guy, yes sir, free bags for whatever you say, because they don't realise my son's not here. There are kids dying. I have to do this by any means necessary. And I don't have time to lie down and, and, and play the nice dog and get my belly stroked and rubbed. Um, so I wanted to go around any way I could. So basically, in short, I had four fights, won four fights, won a title that, you know, we've got so many belts now that some titles aren't really credible and recognised, but it was still a belt all the same and it still showed them that I could do championship rounds because I went 10 rounds and, and they saw what condition I'm in and I knocked out the other three guys so they could see that I was the biz. And as you saw in there, that wasn't no little guy that's not in shape. I worked really hard and as I do every day to keep myself in shape. So regardless of age, I was performing at high levels. So once again, they had no reason to not license me, but they didn't. So I had to then go back, and this was me trying to go around another way, instead of going through the government, which I don't really pay much mind to anymore. Um, so, so, so now I'm back in that situation because I thought, well, my understanding was to get the platform. I was getting calls to go to America, I was getting calls to do different fights, fight for the W, but I wanted the attention in England and I wanted it on Sky and I wanted the main stations to get a grab of this so I could talk about knife crime. That was the whole thing. That's why I wanted the platform. So because I couldn't do that, I just thought there's no point me carrying on because I'm not fighting for money. Even though I needed it, I'm not fighting for that and I'm not fighting for me. I, I don't need the attention and the acclaim. I need to do this, what I'm doing, the work. So now I'm back finding, trying to find another way how to do this. And you're right, I am looking for the people support. I am showing the people that this is your community charity. I come from areas like yourself and um, I care about the people and the people's children. And all the work I'm doing is focused on, that's why we got a strap line for Kyan Prince Foundation, bringing people together. Because this ain't about, it's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's not a poor thing. It's a people thing. If you see our, our mentalities are just in the dregs, the clips I get of violence with girls, guys, what's going on out there, it's a poor mindset. And that's what we need to change. So I'm hoping that the people can support Kyan Prince Foundation, the people can support people like Winston McKenzie, who's trying to make a change for the people and being about the people. And those are the people that we want to support. And this room should be full, we should be telling our friends, we should be sending out social media, my man should be getting blown up so we could show them that we mean serious business and that this ain't no little Mickey Mouse uh, 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 attempt to become mayor. People out here are interested. If Trump can become president, like seriously? If, tr no, no, that's why, do you know what? My, oh man, seriously. Like, it's amazing. So, so, you know, well done Winston once again. Um, and I pray that if there's anyone here that knows anyone that could further what we're trying to do bolster it, take it to another level. Because I'm sure if everyone puts their heads together, we start linking with people. We know somebody who's got a contact with that person and things start happening. But, but a premises is needed. We need to be able to, I've got a powerful message and a solution to get it out to all the schools. But how do I do that? How do I give my full time to something with no resources? Do you know what I'm saying? Just getting here is a problem. That's how deep it is. And I'm not embarrassed to say it. That is how deep this is on a daily basis because I'm committed to this. Because the minute I take up a job, this life is finished. I can't be doing both. Just like I can't be boxing and doing this. That's why I've, I said, okay, at 47 was my last fight. Um, and I said, let me focus on building 
the Kyan Prince Foundation and, and let me focus on helping the young people. So you have got people out there trying to do stuff to end the knife crime, but you're not seeing them because national TV don't want to highlight what they're doing. Uh, we're not getting the support and the backing from the media or the government. So it's making life really, really difficult. And that's just one voice for me. There are many, many other voices and stories. I'm just one person speaking for them all. So I hope you guys get it. Um, thanks a lot. Just, uh, Prince, could you just... Has anybody got any... Uh, do you know, this reminds me of... Um, what's his name? Uh, your bloke on, on, on BBC Two that does the, um, the music. What's his name? Jules Holland. Yeah, I'm Jules Holland, didn't I? Yeah. I'm Jules Holland. Listen, <laughs> has anyone got any questions they want to throw at Prince before he leaves the stage? And I wanted to ask, how can ordinary people like myself, because what you've said today, I never heard this before. Okay. And I, too, am concerned about our young people, especially the young men in the community. Yeah. So I want to know how I and any other ordinary people in my community can come forward, step forward to help you on the ground surface, ground level. Ground level. Ground level. Because I believe what you're saying is right. I have the same thinking. It's got to be tackled from the ground yeah. up. Stuff is coming down onto the situation. Yep. But it's not filtering where it needs to be filtered. That's right. And we're seeing it on the streets. To me, it could be things like those chicken shops need to go. <laughs> those chicken shops need to go. <laughs> They're not feeding our children's <laughs> brains. Afternoon. <laughs> After lunch. Yeah. You know, that's that's I digress. Yes. But that's yes. massive because yes. one of the areas that KPF yeah. deal with is health. Yes. Because we recognise food and the mind and the body yes. is all connected. Yes. There's no point me training this young person about changing his mindset when he's feeding his body. You are what you're eating. So he's feeding his body with garbage and he's trying to take in knowledge yes. that it doesn't work. So we, we change those areas and we educate them about mm -hmm. what they're eating and the effects it has on them. Being up for the night, trying to come in and take in lessons from a teacher yes. when you didn't go to your bed because you're on your phone till two in the morning, you are munching till 12. Your Xbox. Do you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, let me answer yes. you. Thank what you. I was going to say was um, that last week I got a phone call. I, I knew the guy, but I hadn't seen him for years. And he said, oh, Prince, um, when are you doing anything with the young people again? So I said, I'm going, I'm going tomorrow to do a, a school down in Tottenham. Mm -hmm. um, he said, can I come? So I was quite surprised, because I know people say, yeah, Prince, I'm gonna come and see what you do, but they don't ever call and come. So I said, are you all right then? And it was great anyway, because on that day, I didn't really have any petrol to get down to school, so I was glad, because he, he, he didn't know this, but he just said to me, I'll pick you up, I'll take you down there and bring you back home. So I was like, sweet. <laughs> yeah, so I got to get down there, but he was so, what the word they use in the street is gassed. Mm -hmm. He was so excited. Basically, yeah, he was so gassed about what he saw. He was like, oh, Prince, let me take some pictures. You know, more people need to know about this and what's going on. Because he just sat in mm -hmm. and watched me handle a group of 12 kids that are giving the school a lot of problems and they want to exclude some of them. But before they do that, they're bringing us in. Yes. And these kids that they call bad, yes. they're great kids. Because yes. all I'm doing is doing what I would do if you were at home. You come in through the door, you're not gonna, you can't walk in past your parents and they've opened the door for you and you just walk in and go in the house. So I'm doing standard things. I'm treating these children like they're mine. I'm caring for them like they're all little cayennes. Do you understand me? The girls, same thing. I'm looking after them and educating them how they need to value their self, value their bodies, value their minds. Don't allow the system to keep feeding all this garbage to you. That, you know, what you see on the screen and what you, that's who you've got to be. That's who you've got to look up to. No. So we set a whole new standard for them and they're buying into it. They're loving it. That's very powerful stuff. So, so you coming on board, I would say to you, what skill do you have? What are you passionate about? Uh, and whatever it is you can do, you might just be good at talking with people. Mm. 
So we would have you coming out, we'd pick a spot, maybe in a shopping city, because these are things you want to do as well. Get KPF brand out there, let yes. people know. Go into a shopping centre, we go with a few people, a team of people, they put on KPF t-shirt and they just meet people. Tell them what we're doing, have a little bucket and just start raising the funds because, you know, we could be doing more. Because I've got to be saying to the school, could you give us some money to be able to do this? And we know what the schools are like. It's all red tape. Oh, we don't have the money, blah, blah, blah. All these different excuses. I just had a primary school call me recently and say, oh, we need you to come down. A teenager's been killed outside of our school. The kids are traumatized. We really want you to come in. Do you do primary school? I said, of course we do primary schools. Yeah, we take it down. We feed the children for their age group. And they said, yeah, great. She was so excited that when I offered to her, why don't we do, why don't we get the young children to do something that London's never seen. Little children doing a march, mm -hmm. and I'll talk to them about what they need to be focused on. They need to be focused on letting the older children know that we don't like the way that you're giving us an example of stabbing each other, and it's all about trainers and money and drugs. We want to live, we want to have a future, and you need to be a better example to her. Now, that's a powerful image. We want to turn on the ITV news and see stuff like that. You think I'll get the chance to do that? She was all excited. Yes, we're going to do it. We'll get this. I'm going to go to the head. Blah, blah. She goes to the head. She says, yes, we're going to do this. She phones me up yesterday. I hear this different tone. Mm -hmm. She starts mumbling, fumbling. It's like, oh, um, Prince, you know, red tape, red tape. So I said, could you tell me the truth? What is the reason why you're getting cold on this? No, and, you know, it's just red tape. You know, we, we're going to do it, but, you know, it's just red tape. And it's like, and this is what I deal with with our school system. It's like I'm fighting everyone in this thing. Like, how could you be battling those same kids that are carrying knives go to your school? Little children, if you know what's going on in primary schools, I'm telling you guys, it will blow your mind what is going on in our primary schools. I'm getting more calls from primary schools about kids and their behavior the way that they're bullying, violent, sexual, in school, like, oh man, it, seriously, we got some serious problems with our young people and everyone wants to turn a blind eye, shove it under the carpet and say, we don't want our school to be known like this. So, you know, even Kyan's school, I tried to get a bench, he's, they said he's a role model to all the kids, so if he's a role model, do a little plaque for him, this is where he died right here. Oh no, 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 oh no, 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 we don't want to be remembered for the guy that got killed at the school, because that might affect our Ofsted and our reports and parents, how they see the school. This is what I'm up against. And it's ugly, but it's real. Okay, Prince, we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Cool, bro. One big hand for this man. <laughs> big hand. Absolutely fantastic. Well, um, after I'd been on stage in London and, um, as Nigel Farage would say, how do I match that? <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce you to a um, remarkable young lady now who runs an academy in... Um, hi there, Lawrence. Hi. In... Where's your academy? Yeah, I haven't got it here. <laughs> Marianne? Deborah J. Kelly runs an academy in Loughton. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's a youth academy, it just reaches out to the community generally and people who are interested in various different aspects of life. And just as well presented as Deborah is, is how our students are turned out. I'd now give the stage to Deborah and um, I think you'll be fascinated in hearing some of the things Deborah has to say. Deborah, please. Hello, everyone. As you probably know, I'm Deborah J. Kelly, um, and I met Winston, as he was saying, um, at an event. And it was quite interesting, his interpretation of who I actually am. And that just really leads me to talk about the appearance of people and how we're actually given an impression before we've spoken. 
okay? Um, my appearance was quite interesting because he did actually say that uh, he thought, well, who on earth is she? And that I wasn't actually going to be very friendly to him, which is completely the opposite person to who consider a real compliment because I'm 51. So, you know, so to get to 50 and be called Barbie is rather lovely. Um, and yes, I am kind of in the, if you can call it the spotlight, I hate the word celebrity. Where does that come from anyway? I'm not a celebrity. I just happen to be at events and people happen to photograph me and through that people have started to listen to me. I find the more I know, the less I talk about it. Um, now, my background, um, just because obviously, you know, Mark, his speech really, you know, touched me. Um, my background um, is, has sexual, physical abuse, adoption, fostering, bullying, yeah, all of those things. And I think sometimes out of suffering, it's what makes us rich as a person, right? Because we can get down and dirty in the community and relate to everybody. That means I might talk to a prince and then I might talk to, you know, somebody, a youth, a person who doesn't believe in themselves, they don't think they've got any future, they've come from an underprivileged background. You know, I grew up in a council house, um, but I had a vision, right? And my vision was so powerful that it didn't matter how much people kept knocking me back I kept getting up, dusting myself off, and trying again, okay? Um, I was very ill for 10 years. Um, it thwarted my dreams. You know, I knew where I wanted to be. You know, I knew what I wanted to do. I was a journalist um, in television and media and everything. And then I got sick. And it was the worst thing for me because I was visually in the spotlight and all of a sudden I got a debilitating illness that made me so sick I used to have to wear gloves, a mask, bandages every day. Actually it was one of the contributors to the end of my marriage unfortunately. So you know so then all of a sudden I was this guinea pig. I was going in and out and in and out of like hospitals being given this new drug and that new drug and as a result of it my hair fell out. Um, I got covered in scars and when people look at me, they don't see that. Yeah, they see the, the false hair, um, which is extensions. Yeah, they see the way that I portray myself. That didn't come easily, okay? I actually received, you know, healing much later on in life. Um, and now I'm making the most of doing what I can do. So I have 65 diplomas and degrees, uh, 15 accolades and awards. I've got three websites, eight books. Um, I write blogs. 
uh, and I'm doing everything I possibly can to help the youth of today because they're our future leaders. So at the end of the day, they're the people that we really need to be focusing on because they're going to be standing here in the future running lives. Yeah? So if we don't help them to fulfil their dreams and encourage them and help them with their knockbacks, and if they don't have money, get off our backside and say to them, do you know what, a little thing that I can do will help you, like I can put you on my website for free. And out of that, that might spiral because somebody sees that and somebody says, do you want to go and do that for me? So I think it's really important for people to get together and to create our own world along with Winston. Winston has the visions. You know, we have the vision in this room and we have friends and they have friends. And out of that, we can build this community because it's through us and our understanding that really then starts to build the world. Yeah, because we are the people and we need to be heard. So I just wanted to say that. I know I get really passionate when I talk about things, but somebody actually said to me a um, very long time ago, fake it until you make it. And I had absolutely no idea what this person was saying to me. I thought, well, I can't lie. You know, I am a nobody. I still am a nobody. But the point is that how can I fake something? You know, how does that involve... So I set about creating Deborah J. Kelly. I set about creating my image. Um, like Winston said, I made sure that I looked who I wanted to be even if I went to the shop, right? Because it's really important to be who you are and to, and to, be an imp to, to make that expression of who you are as well at all times. And that has really changed my life. If you work in something you hate and you're continually told that you want to, you know, just have a job, like my father used to say to me, just go and get a job, yeah? All you've got to do is try to earn money. It doesn't mean if you're really unhappy, you know, just work, yeah? But I had a vision and a dream. And like Mark said, there's such a lot of work that I do that is unpaid. You know, people look at me and they think, oh, yeah, you know, she's Deborah J. Kelly. I, I would say 60 to 70% of the work that I do for charities, underprivileged children, ethnic minorities, I'm an ambassador for ladies of all nations, is all unpaid. But I also need to have a salary, henceforth the Angel Academy. And that's how the Angel Academy of Teaching and Training was born. I was fed up with having to find my own way. Okay, I used to know loads. But it didn't matter what I knew. It wasn't until I met the people that could help me that it became something. Because with all these knowledge and all these talents that children have, if they're not given a chance to actually get out there by the people that they meet who can help them, they can give them you know, a lift off of the ground, then where are they supposed to go? You know, there's knockbacks. You know, people keep saying to me they can't live their dream. And I'm really passionate about this because I now live my dream. You know, I'm now the epitome of a beauty... I, I own a beauty school. I've created that, but I've also created my own world. So, my own world is youth. I take the young people... Like, again, like Mark said, I didn't have any resources, so I started my school in my front room. Yeah, I converted my front room and I started inviting young people, youth, into my home, which is quite a private place, isn't it? Yeah? Into my home where they could train for half price because I didn't have to pay rent or rates. And that's how it started, really, and then it spiralled, and then all of my youthful, you know, my, my students who are friends of mine, some of them since 2000 when I founded my, you know, the Angel Academy, um, have now gone on. They have their own salons. They're working on seven-star cruise ships. They've gone abroad because our certifications are international. So I've got people that have gone back to Africa, gone back to the Caribbean, and they've started up these enormous salons and spas. And I, they keep in contact with me, and I can see what they're doing. And I think, you know, offering these people encouragement telling them that they really can succeed, offering them a way when they don't think there is a way. Because we still live in a world that is, is really revolving around money. You know, if you don't have money, how do you start? So I've, I've gone to people's houses. I've gone to, I went to a young girl's house who had multiple sclerosis, and she, it's terminal. I mean, she's got the worst one. She's going to die. And I actually went to her house, and I trained her in her bed. 
So I think, you know, we, we really have to have, you know, a passion to listen to our youth and to, and to also integrate with them and, to, and, and if they say there is no hope, to tell them that there is hope, yeah, and to tell them that it starts with just, just having that conversation with you and then you can spread the word and then the word gets spread by others and so forth. So, you know, th that for me is really, you know, the most important thing. Oops, sorry. So just going back to Winston and his, uh, his conversations, you know, I listened to his speech today and I think there's some really fresh innovative ideas coming out. Um, and he said to me, you know, can you speak? Can you get up and speak um, and, and talk about the youth, you know, because they're our future? And he said, you know, you're a public speaker, you'll do brilliantly. Yeah, you can just get up there and you can just speak and say anything. Actually, I'm not a public speaker. I suffered from a huge lack of self-confidence when I had my illness. I couldn't even say boo to a goose. I'd be thinking what every single one of you was thinking about me and thinking that it would be negative. Yeah, and then saying like, I'm a shrinking violet. Oh my God, I've said something wrong. I can't do this, I can't do that. And now I'm probably the most confident woman in the world. And this is the way that I want to talk to the youth. I want to encourage them. I want to tell them that they can achieve, okay? And they say that just by being in my company when I talk to them has given them the chance and the belief that actually as one person, they can change the world. Because it only takes one person, yeah? It only takes one person to change things. And that's probably about it, really. Um, I've got some questions here that somebody has written, which I found were quite interesting, and I, I want to address them. Um, somebody has asked me about girls' aspirations to be famous and the Instagram frenzy, um, you know, of Facebook social media, it just pinged then, didn't it? Um, what do I think about all of this? Okay, it's quite interesting, really, because when I was quite ill, you know, I, I would look at people and they would be complaining, you know, because they had a spot on their face and I was covered in eczema. So badly, I got septicema and, and actually, yeah, other things, pneumonia as well. I mean, I was seriously ill and I was thinking like, why are you worrying about that spot on your face? You know, and I can't even, I can't even go out in the public and the public are looking at me and going, ugh. You know, it really was horrible. Um, so what is fame anyway? You know, we're covered, we see all these things like the Kardashians, okay? I've got girls coming to my school now who are 16 who are talking about Botox. I don't know if all of you know what Botox is, but they're talking about Botox, and I haven't had it, by the way. So I'm one of those people that gives them a mum talk, and I say to them, are you, are you mad? You know, what, why are you trying to do, you know, you want to have an expression. What do you want to do? Why do you want to be plastic? It's because of social media. You know, this is an issue now. It has positive and negative stances. The positivity is we can network with so many people. We can get our name out, to so many places we couldn't do without social media. But people look at my media, they look at Deborah J. Kelly on Facebook, and they say, well, what does she know about life? You know, she's glamorous, she's a celebrity, she's photographed in ball gowns, she's got paparazzi. Yeah, I don't get paid. I don't live in a ball gown. I work seven days a week, sometimes five nights a week. For, and I always have done, I'm a complete workaholic, because I feel that I have a responsibility to young women and men, but to youth, to help them. And if I don't have a responsibility, what am I doing? I have to have a passion, and my passion is gonna to be to help other people. But yes, they do rely on it. You know, people, I've seen them, they sit across the table from each other, and instead of talking to each other and having dinner, they're on Facebook. They're actually messaging somebody else. Yeah, I used to play out, we used to play, yeah, we used to have like a big typewriter, I did Pitmans, my Pitmans, you know, like, like this. I had to teach myself how to use a computer, I mean, it's not my background, but now there's so much pressure that I have to be on social media, right, because I need to get myself out there, so I've actually self-taught myself. And this is what the youth need to do, they need to come in and they need to be mentored, they need to be told this is what they can do and helped, yeah? All they need is a little bit of help, a little bit of encouragement, um, and they're well away. 
So my answer is, it's good and bad. I think it stopped a lot of integration, a lot of community, because they can just speak to somebody without seeing them. And it's really easy to do that, isn't it? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, you know, they, they can't communicate to people in public, you know, can't have a normal conversation with somebody. So I think, you know, being famous as well. Um, have I got time to talk about the pageant industry? Is that, is that, is that okay? Yeah? So there was a lady that was going to come here today who I've seen um, at many um, pageants. She's a pageant queen, actually, and so am I. Um, so at 50, upon my divorce, uh, I decided for a complete joke to enter a pageant uh, for 50-plus women, and I actually won. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm now changing that too. I've now started, there's four, four different pageants now for 50 plus women of all shapes and sizes, every colour, every creed, plus size modelling. This is the whole thing to give everybody an opportunity because life isn't like, it doesn't finish because you're 50. Life begins at 50 for me and when I get to 60, it will begin at 60 as well. Um, so, you know, so I want to get out there and we do a lot for youth as well. So we have like the little girls you know, and they're, and they're dressed up and they're lovely and all of them should get a chance to feel that they are beautiful because every single child, if every colour and every creed and culture is beautiful. And they always have things in them that are beautiful if you look past the surface, yeah? So we're looking at, you know, their soul actually, but, you know, that may be a bit deep. So, um, yeah, so pageants. Um, so I came into pageants very, very late on in life. I, I was the, like, in my day, we used to watch Miss World. Yeah, me and my mum, because my mum doesn't look like me at all. She's a mumsy, yeah, she doesn't wear makeup. And we used to sit there and pick these girls apart when we were young. You know, we go, oh, yeah, you know, look at her and whatever. Because we're just seeing a face. But actually getting in with these girls backstage, I realise a lot of the girls are, is a result of bullying, it's a result of abuse. There's so many of them, and they just want recognition. They just want to feel like they are somebody. Yeah, they want you to clap. Whatever it is, they have stories to tell. And I think sometimes, you know, we look at people and we make a we make an assumption by what we see, right? But actually, sometimes we have no idea what is like in the background. And I have met some amazing girls. Little young girls, I do a lot in the African, Afro-Caribbean um, society. I'm very blessed to have been invited into a fabulous industry with them. And there's young Afro-Caribbean girls and boys um, on the catwalk, having a wonderful time, really, you know, walking there and feeling like they are, you know, somebody. And I want to encourage them to actually continue being that because everybody is somebody. My other question was, what are the opportunities for young women to access the beauty industry? Which is a fantastic question. I started the Angel Academy because people don't know how to get into, into the industry. People love beauty. You know, the children, they love beauty. But it's a quagmire. If you Google, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of schools. A lot of them are run by money alone. So they're just a financial institution. They don't actually want to mentor and they don't really care when the person leaves the school and gets their accreditation. So I started my school to listen to the needs of our young students because I started out in colleges doing evening classes. Um, and there was not enough encouragement. It was all about numbers. It was about politics. It was about criteria. And we actually wanted to change that and to cater for individual children's needs. Um, I also wanted to just talk about the council as well and funding, because we never got it. Um, so I started in my, in my front room, Mark, because I, I couldn't get funding you know, um, from the government at all. Um, the colleges could get funding, like the big institutions, but I couldn't provide the paperwork or the books or anything for me to get funding. Um, so I don't like barriers. So I started it up myself um, in my home in order to do what I needed to do. Um, but I think it's, it's very important that children you know, and young women, because you don't get into the beauty industry. You know, a, a young girl doesn't say, well, I want to be a beauty therapist because I want to be a millionaire. She doesn't. She says, I want to be a beauty therapist because I love beauty and I love the industry. 
and there's a lot of bad pay in the industry. You know, it's like six pound an hour. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I really see it that, you know, we need to encourage them to actually get out there and to start, you know, earning some serious money because there are so many ways that you can do that in the beauty industry, but they need to be informed correctly. Um, have you got a couple of bits and pieces to... Yeah, so this is... I, I talk on the Dr Pauline Long show, actually, um, and I'm part of a panel, um, and we do talk a about a lot of, you know, issues... Um, that young women are facing at the moment. Um, you haven't got any of the students' testimonials up there, no? Okay. Oh, never mind. Right. Yeah, they, I've... They, well, maybe I'll just talk about them then, shall I? I was just going to show you some of the children that have come to me who I've sort of mentored, really, through 10 years, um, and some of them in, you know, all different cultures and creeds. Some, some of them got absolutely no money, um, and we've managed to do things for them, uh, finan you know, finance, um, so that they can get the course, get out there, start making money. Um, we do NVQs, so they're internationally recognised, level twos, threes and fours. Um, and I was just going to talk to you about some of the, some of the, well, hundreds of students, really, um, that we've taken through, but it's they're not up there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so I'll, I'll finish there unless there's any other questions. Is there? I think, ladies and gentlemen, we we'll all agree that um, De Deborah's been fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank you. So much of what we were about. So many of these issues, we just we don't we don't hear about them, and if we do hear about them, nothing's done. But we're going to change all that. We're going to change all that. And as, you know, Donald Trump says, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank well done. You. Thank well done. you. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to move on now. And we're going to have stop for a late lunch. But not just now. Just before we do that, I'm going to ask um, world-renowned Barry Toombs, and television presenter, um, Monica. Monica, I've forgotten your surname. Price. Monica Price. <laughs> How could I forget? How could I forget? To so come forward. And you'll love my record. <laughs> this is Winston McKenzie singing here. Do we need a mic? Do we need, we're going to use the mic then, are we? Yes. Okay. They're going to do an amazing presentation. I won't tell you what it's about, but I'll leave it to them to explain. Right, good afternoon, and uh, if this mic's not working, is it? This mic's not working. Okay, okay, right. Thank you for your presentation, guys. I'm Barry Tomes, this is Monica Price. We've been on a journey for the last 18 months. And when Winston said, can you come and do a talk for our fair, we said, we're very shy. You know, we're not, we don't really know what to say. We're really shy people. You can get that, right? He gets that. He's very shy. So what we're going to do, we're going to show you an 11 minute film that we've been nominated for an award. And the journey for us is about autism. And the reason you're hearing that song, I don't want to talk about it, one thing we learned is people don't want to talk about autism because they don't understand it. So what we're going to do, I'm going to let Monica say a few words and then we're going to show you an 11 minute uh, film that we've been nominated in the diversity category. Okay, Monica Price. Hi everybody, hi, um, my name's Monica Price, um, I'm the presenter and the producer of this lovely um, short film called Let Me In, A Short Story, and as Barry said, it's been an incredible journey, uh, we're going to let you watch it, but we filmed in the UK, we went to Jamaica, and we filmed in the USA as well, so it was just an incredible journey, and it was an absolute privilege, because this is a, uh, a whole kind of area where we just don't talk about, and it's just wonderful that we can, were able to be here with Winston to talk about these issues. So without further ado, I think we'll look at it first. Cue we the camera. Cue the camera. We'll step aside. <coughs>
certain steps for a parent with a child with autism is to stop mourning the child that they thought they had and start embracing the child that they have. It's, it's interesting because initially the label is difficult because as a parent you don't know what that means. What does that mean for your child that they're autistic? What does that mean for their future? So I would say if you have a child that's not speaking, that's a red flag, a child that's not looking at you, a child that's not playing with another child, those are a red flag, a child that becomes obsessed with say a toy, um, a particular object, uh, being obsessed in sitting on this chair only, those are key to look at. And I had a kid once who would only eat a cereal if it's lined up in a row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven cards, amazing. Ty, now it's your turn, ready? Give me, the girl is drinking milk. Amazing, what is she doing? Drinking milk. Milk, good job. Give me, the boy, let's put this one down, ready? The girl is brushing her hair. You got it. Fantastic. What is the girl doing? Brushing hair. Awesome with this. Show me. Yep. You brush Every hair. child is affected differently. Some people are affected with all of the different disabilities, and some kids might have one or two of them. You know, so you have to assess the child accordingly and then tell them the education for each specific child. In every human being on this planet is as important as the next one. So why do we pass these aside? They, they, they need more help. We're in the position to do it. We should do it. It's, it. It should be, you know, in the state of Ireland, it's said that if you're born into the state of Ireland, that you're entitled to a free education. Why can't the child be entitled to a free, appropriate education to your specific needs? Yes, it's more expensive on the short term. On the long term, the state would save a fortune. Because if you give these children the appropriate intervention they need at the right stage of their life, they won't be as dependent on the state when they get older as an adolescent or a young adult in, 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 in residential care or respite, which costs an absolute fortune. You know, they, they, they can be taught the skills they need to survive in our society a lot of the time. Going back 20 years ago, we haven't got the, the intelligence that we have now. I understand. But now that we do understand and we have got the intelligence, it's, it's an absolute crime that the government and the Board of Education and the Board of Health don't recognize this and give these children a fighting chance. Isabella was diagnosed, she met all her milestones, but around two years old, we realized that she didn't have any words. And uh, we talked to our pediatrician about the fact that she was developing normally, but didn't have language. And the, my, our pediatrician suggested that maybe because she was bilingual, maybe she was confused as to which language she should be using, which to me just analytically didn't make sense because if a person is listening to two languages, you would think they would say something in either language. And she wasn't saying anything, not mom, not dad, nothing. And so um, we had to confront the fact that maybe something was wrong. And so we started to take her to um, specialists. And it took about three, three visits, uh, three observations, three evaluations to really have to understand that she was autistic. And the first time that we heard it, they're like, no, something must be wrong because she didn't seem that, that anything was wrong with her with the exception of language. So we just kept going to different doctors to see whether that, the diagnosis would be different. But by the third time, we, we knew that we had to accept what that meant. He's loving it, look, they love the cameras. All the children love the camera equipment. That's what I realized. Abdul, Abdul, yes, we went to somewhere and the camera, the boy just couldn't. It's just cheese! <laughs> when my dream for them is to see him going to a regular high school and to see him having, doing the exam, has the exam, going to high school, going to college. That's my really dream. So I would love to see the government for interfering. Integration, where they will no. sit with normal kids and, you know. Well, they will always look with us. Even as we get older and become old, People, they will always be with us in our eyes. They will never be leaving the home. This is their home. This is their home. We see that we live here with them. You know, everything is about them. Um, we we'll, we'll work towards, along with school, making them as independent as possible. So they can do as many things as they can, like Lucas and I will drink out to an open top cup. 
when you're 11, you think, well, I should have been doing that years ago, but that's took, like, all it means to get to drink out of an open top cup, but he's doing it now, and kind of feeding themselves. We'd, we'd love to have a toiletry the moment before, yeah. but they won't say, but... The, the biggest thing that we would love to hear is basic language. Yeah. The, the biggest thing for us is to hear those words, Dad, that is massive to us. You know, parents take that for granted, you know, but for us to hear just those words, Dad, would be huge to us. It would be absolutely massive. If we could get the boys to kind of say Dad, or if they tell us they're in pain, because when they are poor and they're in pain, a lot of it is guesswork all the time to try and isolate where the pain is and see what kind of pain it is. <laughs> So those are the breakthroughs that I live for. But the parents that we won't have to stay positive. 
you know, in, in comparison to people that get things done. That's what's happened in the past. That would, that's what's working. So you have to look at what works and try to drive that forward and hope to kind of drag people along with you along the way. Um, so, in my opinion, I think you know, we have to keep on fighting for what they need, try to put in place what we can ourselves, find ways to get the money to do it, that's what we need to do, and just, and just be the voices for those people that have not. The relevance to this today is we didn't go to Channel 4 or Channel 5 or ITV or the BBC or any of the people with the big money. We went to people that were involved and had problems with autism. We made the documentary the way we thought it should be told not produced to suit an advert or a demographic or even a time slot on TV. We made it by people for people. We have no contact with autism. We have no family or friends that had any kind of connection to autism. So we came to it as novices. I know that Winston, and it's about him today, he can make a difference. He can make a difference because he's a people person. Mark can make a difference because he's a people person. The influence of Deborah can make a difference. People never declare war. People never put taxes up. People don't cause the problems. It's often governments and disagreements with governments. So we need people to look after the people. And that's all I'll say. And I'll hand you over to Monica. And if you've got any questions, please ask. Great. Well, as you can see, it was, it was an amazing experience. It really was. I first let, met um, Lena, Lena Michaela Niji. She was Jamaican-born, now living in New Jersey. And when I met her, she came on my television show. I was completely blown away. And I knew a little bit about autism because I'm a, I'm a nutritional expert. I'm a nutritionist. So I knew about it and I knew how, I know imp how important food is in behavioral problems. So I, I knew that, but I didn't know anything else. And it took 18 months and pretty much like you know we've, we've just said we did it you know we kept going to all these big organizations saying this this story needs to be heard they weren't interested you know then they're not interested they're just so we'd said right you know we're going we're going to just do this ourselves let me interrupt there the first people we contacted was oh, yeah. the national autistic society yeah. and you know what they said we, we wouldn't be interested don't in don't think like it's that. interested enough for us, yeah. Not really. And, and that was, and there lie in really a sort of determination. And as you can see, we, we got um, Keith Duffy on board, a boy zone, who's now a boy's, 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 boy's life. life. Boy's life. Something and uh, uh, that's Coronation right, Coronation Street, of course, because he has an autistic daughter. Now, he's so passionate about autism. I mean, there's a guy who's got money. He's got the credibility. He's a well-known national celebrity throughout the world with, with his musical talents. And yet, he can't get the services that he had for his daughter. And he actually funded it himself, built his own school, you know, got things himself because he was just so sick and tired of the Irish government saying that they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and they didn't do anything. And the thing about autism, now we're in this, we've kind of been on this journey, and we're just completely humbled and honoured that we've been recognised by the Royal Television Society for this film, and it's up for the Diversity Award, as Barry said, this year in November. So, you know, but what we need is to keep keep getting that story out there. And someone like Winston can take these ordinary people who have got incredible stories and people need to know about it. People need to know that in, you know, let's just talk about the UK, never mind Jamaica, where the average age of someone who's diagnosed with autism as a child is about 11, I think it was. The stigma in Jamaica was horrendous. But we interviewed, I interviewed the Minister of Education and asked him straight out. Is there a stigma in Jamaica? He said, yes, there is, and we're going to change that. Back here in the UK, let's talk to the UK. The stigma's the same. People don't want to know. When the boy's having a complete meltdown in a supermarket, people kind of walk past and go, what on earth is happening? That poor mother, what's going on? But no one actually helps anybody. 
And that's what we need to do. We need to stop looking and putting them in a box. We need to actually help these people because it could be any one of us, any one of us, you know, any one of their, their children as well. So it's been a complete pleasure, really, to work with these children and the parents. So, yes, if you'd like to ask any questions, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Best. Um, I'm an expert on autism. Oh, Fantastic. there we are then. Very we needed you. So. <laughs> now, later on, I'm actually here. In up, Sorry? Oh, yes, yeah, stand up. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to be talking in place of uh, Chris Day, oh, who's right. actually my publisher, because he was meant to be here, but his wife is has got a very bad bout of MS today. Right. And he's had to look after her. So I'm actually... Um, going to be talking to you all about uh, publishing later, publishing a book and why working with a publisher like Chris Day is so vital. I, but if it, as you can see, I was actually diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, right. autism, ADHD and lots of other stuff when I was 49 years old. Yes. I was not toilet trained. I was low functioning autism when I was young. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go there. And that's the thing the with moment. autism, Lawrence, isn't it? That we, we discovered that the spectrum is so huge. Now, if, let me just you know. say something. I want to make an apology to you. I could not watch your film. I think I've seen it before. But that's the point being is that my coping mechanism didn't allow me to watch it. I had to go outside. I started crying. Mm. I get very emotional. Now, there is another condition. I, because of what I've been through, I was actually abused by a pedophile when I was young. I actually took up the courage of going into a police station two years ago and uh, reporting historical sexual abuse. Now, if I stop in talking, it's because I had need to catch my breath to stop myself getting very emotional. And I have actually studied and researched why paedophiles abuse and how to recognize people who are likely to abuse. There's a condition called alexithymia. Have anybody heard of this condition called alexithymia? Can I just say, we want to hear your story. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Your story, wouldn't it? At, yeah. The at the moment, the stage belongs to these two guys. I understand that. And, but, I'll I'll uh, but I need to hear your story later. Yeah, just so yeah, you just give us a break. Very give us a break. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, yeah. 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 We yeah. want to hear. Don't give it all away, Lawrence. Sorry that I got carried away. No, it's absolutely like no problem yeah. at all. It's a I pleasure to, have, to um, I need to be told to, to stop. That's no, it. it's absolutely Thanks. fine, Lawrence. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else got a question? Anybody else? Hello. Hello, Vivian. Hello, Vivian. Hi. Thank you so much. That was a lovely video. Thank very you. Touching. Thank you. How do we help your initiative you know absolutely well it, yeah, that's a very good question yeah. So that, yeah very good question nice this is just what we call a short film we've actually filmed a whole hour's documentary which we're going to take to the you know to the channels to see if they like it where well, they like it we hope but um this was we did this short so we could we could actually it was like a precursor really to get people's attention the Royal Television Society got their attention, so that's good, because that's what we need. You know, we need to build the momentum. So we, the let me in is like the mothership. And then from there, you saw their Jim the Trim, um, James Williams. He is an awesome barber. You know, he has people come from all over the UK to have their child's hair cut because he's just so good. He literally will just wander all around the room with them. He's just incredible. So we're going to do a whole series just on him. That's currently being filmed. Um, and then the other family you saw with... Um, did see too much of the children in there with... Um, Paul Atwell Bryce and Michael Atwell Bryce with their two identical twins. Now they they're a um, same sex couple and they adopted these babies when they were younger, having no idea that they had autism or anything wrong with them, only to discover that when they were about three, they have now have life threatening epilepsy, they're doubly incontinent, they have autism at the far end of the spur and they and people said, Well you've got to give them back. And they were, it's an incredible story. Children. Yeah, you know, you know, back. what do you mean we've got to give back? So, uh, but that's the kind of thing that they, yeah. they, they had to deal with. And other couples we've met, we went to Scotland and met this incredible uh, mum and daughter who all the, all the lady, all the girl did, she was a young girl, and all she did was scream. And the social services said, well, sh she's never going to talk. You're just going to have to give up on that. And she said, well, she's got she a voice. She said that she's got to yeah, sign language. That's right. That's them, right, yeah. And they said, well, she said, well, she's got to, she's screaming at me, so she's got a vocal cord, so I am going to teach her to, to converse. So she did, she persevered, but that's somebody else who went completely against the kind of state, if you like, she's because she didn't have a voice. Her, yeah, yeah, this that's right. Yeah, 
now a singer, released a record. So we've got some amazing stories, and it's wonderful. So after today, you know, if you want to come and have a chat with us, yes, because we're going to keep this momentum going. We've we've kind of developed now a whole kind of worldwide l lovely bunch of family, really, which is just amazing. And, you know, it has been an incredible journey. It's keep probably worth mentioning on Facebook we have a page called Let Me In. Yes, go to our Facebook go page. What we're encouraging people to do, because say we're complete novices, we, uh, and I'm glad we came to this as a novice. Yeah. Because I've been in the music and entertainment industry 45 years. I've, I've been in the music industry and entertainment industry 45 years, so I'm a complete novice so to autism, but I've done lots of media. So I was glad that we didn't know, because I think we approached it cautiously. We used a lot of emotion. Uh, and most of all, we asked the people what they wanted and what they needed. We didn't tell them what we thought they needed, which is what government do. And uh, Mark was talking about the... Um, the cycle lanes in London, they're not only hideous, but the cyclists come up to a light that's on red and go straight through it and then blame us when they need to get killed. So there are lots of issues and I know that Winston will be really brilliant for this. He'll be superb and we'll support you over the next two years. You know, let's do a nice slow build. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thanks to the guys at the back. They said they're going to make us look good. They're going to put a filter on the camera. And thank you to the people over here. And most of all, thank you to Winston and Marianne for inviting us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. thank you so much, my dear. Thank you. There we go. All yours. Oh, that was fantastic. That was really fantastic. I knew I could put on a good show. Uh, you know, I've got the swagger. I've got what it takes, you know? And listen, don't ever jump up on that ladder and tell yourself you can't. You've got to believe in you. Hang what people say, believe in you. I've been called some names <laughs> since I went into politics. But you know what? I look around and I look at myself and I look in the mirror and I tell myself, Win, you ain't like the others. You're totally different. Now, um, I'm going to... What we're going to do now, we're going to have a short lunch and then come back after lunch. And after lunch, we'll have um, Mr. Ungolo, Sylvan, and the rest of the programme. Um, I'm sure once you come back after lunch, in about an hour and a half, two hours, we'll be, we'll be wrap, wrapping up. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed it up until now. And also, we want to hear from Forever Living. And don't forget, this is all about the entrepreneurs of today. Not tomorrow, of today, this minute. The entrepreneurs who have alternative aspects, alternative um, ideas, as opposed to the big conglomerates who look out for their crowd, their little group. These are the people who are creating something out of nothing. These are the people who are saying, listen, if you haven't got the money, if you haven't got the, the, the thousands, if you haven't got the political polish or the commercial polish, here's another way. And these are the individuals that nobody wants to hear talk. I gave you my example of ITV and London Live yesterday, I gave you my example, unless you're the big conglomerate, the conservative, the Labour, the Liberal Democrats, nobody's listening. So we, together, as a, a people, as a group, with the will, the determination, and the courage, to make our presence felt, will win. We shall win. The people will be heard. Thank you. Can we say we'll be back at quarter past two for the afternoon session?